So just to get us in the mood to have um, a chat with Coach Kerr, who I will welcome in a moment, um, I wanted to start with one piece of trivia, um, which is this following question. And this is really going to separate the true basketball aficionados in the room. So who has the NBA's highest all-time three-pointer percentage? <laughs> Oh. It's a trick. <laughs> it's a trick photo. So they were all the smart. <laughs> yeah. And they were, they were, there ma many academics here, they were all the smartest kid in their class. So <laughs> this is par for the course. Um, we're so thrilled to have you here. Thanks, Coach Kerr, for coming and spending some time with us. We've actually spent the day talking about organizations, motivating people, organizational culture, what makes for successful organizations. And um, you've run a very, very successful organization, created a, a successful organization. Um, and so we really wanted to start with you as a leader. I remember hearing you say um, at some point that you knew for a long time that you wanted to be a coach. And I'm interested in knowing how you knew that and what it is you sort of thought you could bring to an organization to, to make it better. And of course, how you've been able to create um, from your experiences through being a player yourself um, to being exposed to great role models, Phil Jackson and all the other people that you attribute your success to, um, to being on television, to coaching, um, our beloved warriors. If you could just tell us a little bit about sort of your um, thinking about becoming a leader and sure. what was in your mind. Sure. Yeah. Well, I come from a uh, family of academics, actually, and I was uh, the black sheep in the family. Um, um, my dad was a professor at UCLA, and uh, I have, my mom has, she gives the quote when people ask about her, kids, she says, I have two PhDs, an MBA, and an NBA. Uh, that's, her, yeah. that's her line. It's <laughs> a good line. Uh, but, but we have, um, we have a, a long history of teachers in our family. And, and so I think, I think that passed over to me. That part of it did. It's just that my field is a little different. But I think uh, I was always struck by what my family was doing and how many people were always around, um, students, uh, faculty from UCLA at our house. Um, I, I, I like the environment. And I think uh, sports provided that same thing for me, growing up, being on teams and feeling that fellowship, feeling uh, close with my teammates and, and enjoying that process so much. So when I was playing in the NBA, I, I felt like this would be something I'd want to do later on. Um, and I, I waited, um, and I didn't become Warriors coach till I was 49. I waited because I, I wanted to spend more time with my kids who were still under our roof. And coaching in the NBA takes you away an awful lot, uh, all the travel. And so I, I worked in television and had a pretty cush life for, uh, for a few years there. And, uh, as the kids got older and, and moved out on to college, that's when I um, decided to, to go for it with the Warriors. So. Awesome. Great. So um, we're at a culture conference, and tomorrow we're going to be spending a lot of time hearing from company leaders about some of the practices that they use to build effective cultures in their organizations. And you have talked a lot in prior interviews about the type of culture and team chemistry you've sought to build. You've talked about joy and mindfulness, competition, compassion. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how deliberative you've been in trying to create that culture and what specific practices you've used? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when, before I, I got into coaching, I visited with a lot of coaches uh, in different sports and really picked their brains and, and uh, asked, asked everybody, you know, what, what's really important. And um, you know, everybody sort of said the same thing about authenticity. You know, you have to be yourself. And I had great mentors, uh, Phil Jackson and Greg Popovich, and Lenny Wilkins, all Hall of Fame coaches who I played for. 
And I knew that they were authentic and they were unique when I played for them, but I never stopped and thought, okay, what are, what are their values? You know, I, I never stopped and, and gave it any thought, but I felt, I felt those values every day coming in um, to practice. And so one of the things that um, I learned in my, in my quest to, to uh, prepare for coaching uh, was from Pete Carroll, the Seahawks coach. I spent about three days with him, went to, to their practices, and, and, uh, and he pulled me in. This was before our first training camp with the Warriors, so I hadn't coached for a day. And he said, uh, so how are you going to coach your team? And I said, you mean like what offense we're going to run? He goes, no, no, that stuff doesn't even matter. I'm like, that's good. I've just spent years and years <laughs> designing these, you know, this, this, all these plays and all, you know, everything I had in my mind. Um, but it made me think. And, and um, so we had these great discussions about culture. And so what he told me was when he coached in the NFL, um, he coached years ago in New England and, and with the Jets. He said he knew football, but he didn't know about coaching. He got fired. He did okay, but he got fired. He came here to work for the 49ers, and he had a low-level position with the Niners. And every day, he went and sat with Bill Walsh, uh, who by that time had retired as head coach, but was a consultant with the Niners. He sat in his office, and he just picked his brain. Bill Walsh told him all about how he had built the Niners' culture. and. So it was fascinating to hear Pete, who by this time had become, you know, a dominant coach in the NFL and at college and at USC and college. And he talked all about how important it is not just to have values, but to make them come alive every single day. And so he asked me, he said, what are what do you think your values are? And I said, well, um, I haven't thought, thought that through. I just, you know. I, I, and he said, well, go home and think about it. Think about what's, and he said, think about what's the most important thing in your life. What are the most important values in your life? Not in Greg Popovich's life or Phil Jackson's life, in your own life. Since you're going to be coaching these guys, they have to feel the authenticity of you. And if you, if you come in here with uh, genuine, real values, and then you make them come alive, that's when the culture starts to form. And so it was a really interesting few days. And um, there's, you know, there's obviously a lot, a lot that's happened since then, and I'm happy to share more details, but I feel like I've been talking for a long time. So. <laughs> well, I'm interested in what you came up with. Well, so Pete said, he said, go home and think of whatever you got and come in and he's, if it's 10 things, great, it's 10 things. So I came in with probably a list of 10 things and, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, whatever's important in your life and what was important in your family and whatever you feel. And, and I came in, I had a list of things and he said, well, let's narrow these down to the, the four most important things. And, and so those, those, Samir mentioned them earlier. It was, it was joy and compet competitiveness and mindfulness and compassion. And those yeah. were the, the things that I felt probably defined me yeah. um, and, and defined the way I approached my life and, and uh, the way I felt about the world. You know, uh, we, we the, were in the business to try to win. And since I was this tall, like, I just wanted to win at everything. I was so, you know, I was embarrassing to my family, really. <laughs> I remember, I'm not kidding, I, there was, you know, like an Easter egg hunt with the family. And I, <laughs> And I didn't find the golden, the big golden egg, and I threw a tantrum, and everybody in the family thought I was insane, like, or, or the biggest brat on earth. But I just, you know, I had to win, I had to win. And I think at this level, professionally, if you're not competitive, it's gonna be really hard to be successful. And so we try to generate competition in everything we do and practice. So even if it's a light day, we're gonna have, we're gonna keep score. You know, we're going to have shooting drills. And somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. And the guys love it because these guys wouldn't have reached the NBA yeah. if they weren't competitive also. But you try to light that fire, and there's constant competition going on. Where does that competitive drive come from for you? It was, it was innate. It, I was born with it. And uh, yeah, it was geez. sort of a, a disease, really. <laughs> Honestly, it took me about 15 years to be able to behave myself and, and actually sort of 
you know, swallow my pride when, when things would go wrong. And honestly, I would throw huge tantrums. My parents were totally embarrassed. They wouldn't even go to my games when I was little. <laughs> and, uh, but I, try, I finally figured it out. And uh, uh, so that, you know, that was one of the key values. Joy is a really big one. You know, um, I was really hard on myself as, a, as an athlete, as a player. Um, but I, I felt so much joy playing. It was the most freedom that, and still, even to this day, at 54, I can, you know, I can't move around, but, you know, just feeling, feeling free and loose, and, you know, running around. You just there's a there's a, a beautiful feeling with that, and you can imagine what it's like to play in the NBA, you know, for these guys, and the, to be at the top of their profession, and to do this in front of 20,000 fans, euphoric, and if you can perform at a really high level. There's no feeling like it. And so, you know, chicken or the egg, right? If you can create some of that joy that exists before the game starts, you're more likely to reach that level of play, you know, through your, through your, your culture than you are, you know, just reaching it if, you're go if things are going well. So, so a lot of us, um, when we talk about culture, we talk about um, how people fit into a culture or not. Um, in fact, this is what I did my dissertation on, and I remember coming home. I know the interview's about you, but let's talk about me for a minute. Um, I remember coming home and saying to my mom, you know, I, I did this dissertation. It took me about three years. I found that people who fit the culture of their organizations do better when they're part of the organization. She said, Great, three years, nice work. Um, so, um, but the question remains, you know, people come in with kind of different levels of fit to an organization, mm -hmm. particularly if you're emphasizing a set of values. Um, what do you do when people are not assimilating as well or where the, when there's sort of disruption to the team? Would you ever think about um, weighing playing ability against um, the ability to be well integrated into the team and the team culture. How do you yeah, think about that? We face that all the time. Um, and, you know, the question becomes, do you take a, a more talented player who f doesn't quite fit into your culture, or do you take the, the, the perfect culture guy who's less talented? And, uh, the answer is you take Steph Curry because he's both. Yeah. But, but that's why, you know, Steph Curry is Steph Curry. That's why Tim Duncan was Tim Duncan in San Antonio. There's only a handful of guys like that in the whole world, and that's why they're so coveted. Um, but the, the, what I've found is, is if you can, if you're lucky enough to have that cornerstone like we, like we have with Steph, then it's, you have to go culture across the board. Oh, yeah. You have to, um, because the uh, it, the culture is, is is powerful. It's also enjoyable, and you know one thing Greg Popovich told me years ago uh, when I was playing for him in San Antonio, he said I realized after about five years coaching in the NBA that the only thing I really care about is I just want to enjoy my day. Mm -hmm. I want to come in and be be happy seeing the, the the players on the team. If I'm excited about seeing them, it's going to be a great day. And then we're going to have a fun season and a good season. And again, he had Tim Duncan on his team, which you know we have Steph. Um, but the the hard part in the NBA comes if you don't if you don't have that guy. You have to have talent, and so now you're searching, and it's harder to build a culture when you don't have that that cornerstone. And so once you have a guy in place who you really believe in, it's much easier to build and maintain the culture and put the pieces around that player. And that's what we're trying to do with, with our group. Yeah, because I, I guess you're, what you're saying is that capability and cultural orientation are aligned there. Right. And so everyone can look at someone like Steph and say, not only is he super good, but he yeah. also is developing this useful culture. Yeah, you know, and it was interesting because I didn't, I mean, I knew of Steph when I took the job. I didn't know him that well, but, you know, I came in with this idea of, of joy. I really want joy to be a part of things, and you couldn't ask for a better athlete mm -hmm. to fit that ideal and that value because every, every day he is having so much fun in practice, on the plane, 
Uh, even while he's injured, you know, every day he's in there doing his rehab and he's laughing and he's joking around with the guys. He, he just sets an incredible uh, tone. And so you ha if you have that lined up, um, then it, it, it grows more powerful. And it's, and it's even more powerful if you can duplicate that with multiple players. Um, you know, you're never going to get that same talent level. Uh, but if you can get, if you can recruit uh, the, the type of players who fit into that culture, then it really starts to to feed itself, and it's and it's really fun to be part of. I wanted to ask you about the relationship between culture and performance. So we can all think about how you can create a, a team culture that supports winning, uh, but winning can also have a reciprocal effect back on culture. So one question, after a sustained period of success, as the Warriors enjoyed, how did you keep complacency from creeping into the culture? And conversely, in a tough year like this one, yeah. um, how do you sustain the core tenets of the culture? It's a good question. Uh, this, this year has been tough, but um, you know, I, was really, I was really proud today. I had uh, one of my, my players, Glenn Robinson, who's um, it's his first year here. Um, he's on a one-year contract, and he said uh, he came to me and said, "I want you to know, I'm I'm having so much fun this year." And I said, "We've lost nine games in a row." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Imagine if we were winning." And, and I said, "But it meant a lot to me." He said, "He said, uh, and and he can he can tell, you know, these this last couple of weeks has been stressful, and we're, you know, we try not to." Um, let it show too much, but obviously, you know, it, it, losing stinks. It's no fun. But uh, he, he, him saying that meant a lot to me, and I told him that. Um, and I, and I think the idea is by not nitpicking every little detail, and yet continuing to try to improve, and still trying to generate. Some some joy. Uh, we play music during practice. We we do a lot of funny stuff on video. We have a couple of really talented people in our video department who uh, you know do birthday videos that are really well done with you know childhood photos and you know stuff that's pretty touching for the guys that that frankly um, they don't see a lot in other places. Uh, so we try to think of these little details that that can kind of touch them. Um, and it's almost more important through the losing to continue to do these mm -hmm. things because now they know it's, it's real and it's not just like, you know, a reward for winning. It's, it's genuine who we are. We want them to, to feel good about coming to work every day. Yeah. And what about the uh, culture of complacency, how to keep that from yeah, happening? Yeah, that, that was... Uh, that was a big challenge the last two years. Um, and mm -hmm. I think um, one thing that really helped us was um, trying to play uh, a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we developed this uh, strength in numbers mantra, and it came through um, using a lot of players, playing a lot of players. And, and actually, we started doing that mm -hmm. right away. But the last couple of years, it, it, it was helpful because one thing all the veteran players love is to see the young players on the floor. And when they see the, the rookies out there playing, they get excited and they, they start to get more engaged. And so that was one thing we tried to do was really give more responsibility to the younger guys, knowing that it, they weren't always going to succeed, but that it would engage everybody. So this is going to sound a little bit like one of the past questions, but I really wanted to ask a question about Andre Iguodala, so, um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask it it's anyway. One of my favorite guys. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so um, y you know, in the years, um, these past years, the Warriors have been so amazing, um, and you look at the just colossal set of superstars, um, um, many of whom have had superstar careers, many of them had them simultaneously. Like, how do you? How do you get people to, um, to succumb to the needs of the team? Someone right. like Andre Iguodala yeah. or even Livingston, who had this fantastic career. I know they came to the Warriors later in their careers, but, right. but this sort of tension between what's good for me as a player mm -hmm. versus what's good for the organization as yeah. a team. How do you think about that and, and manage that? So I think it, it starts with 
the construction of the roster. Where a lot of teams in sports go wrong is they have all young guys. And if you have all young guys, you know, they're all they're just going to compete against each other and it's you're not going to you're not going to get very far. And so you have to have a nice balance of veteran players, young players. Um, you have to so you have to know who you're putting on your team. So we we had Andre. Um, we got him at a good time. You know, he had already been an All-Star, an Olympian, right. everything else, and and he wanted to be part of a championship team. Um, so that was helpful. But I think um, the the key for for me was this was not like a one one day going up saying, "Hey, what do you think about coming off the bench?" You know, this was more like multiple conversations, getting to know each other, talking about the team, you know, soften them up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but having genuine conversations about um, other teams who have done something similar. So I talked to him about Manu Ginobili from the Spurs. Um. I said, you know, he's, he's one of the best players in the league, and he's been coming off the bench for San Antonio for years because he's, he's more powerful for them off the bench, you know, what if what if you were the, playing that same role? And it, he, he accepted it, uh, but it took some time. You know, there were a couple months early in the season where it was difficult for him. He had started every game of his entire career until yeah. that year. Um, but he's such a smart guy and a, and a caring person about the team that, you know, it, eventually he, he, he grew to love it. He eventually wrote a book called The Sixth Man, which... Oh actually kind of made me proud in a, in a strange way. And um, the best part of the, that whole season was he won the finals MVP yeah. when we moved him to the starting lineup um, after he'd come off the bench the whole year. So it was kind of full circle and the perfect way to cap off this, uh, this season through this you know, sacrifice that he had made. And for to see him rewarded individually was maybe the best part of the whole year. Mm. That's great. One of the uh, things we've been talking about over the course of this conference is the relationship between culture and organizational structure. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've heard about you is that you're someone who's incredibly open to ideas, including play uh, strategies and ideas coming from all parts of the organization, including even ca cameramen sometimes. Um, and so one thing we want to ask you about is how you think about the trade-off of flattening the hierarchy and letting ideas come from wherever versus having more clarity and consistency in decision making? Um, I think it's, it's just a, um, it's a, it's a good way to, uh, to sort of open everything up and let, let everyone know right away that we don't have all the answers. You know, nobody does. And, and, um, and so let's, let's work through this together. Uh, and if, if there's a good idea that comes up, whoever offers it, great. Let's let's utilize it, and and so I tr I I try to do that a lot with my players. Um, so sometimes during a timeout, you know, I'll come over and and uh, and instead of saying, "Hey, we're going to do this," um, I might say, "Hey, what do you guys think about trapping so and so on the next pick and roll?" And um, it's especially good with Draymond because Draymond is a thinker, and he will sometimes say, no, I don't think it's a good idea, and we won't do it. Um, and I think he respects that. And in a, in, a, in a strange way, you gain more respect as a leader when you admit that you don't know everything. And mm -hmm. that when you s sort of let somebody else make a decision, it makes you more powerful. Do you always propose the idea and get their input, or do you sometimes make, just ask the open-ended question, what do you think we should do? Um, sometimes I'll, I'll pose it that way too, you know, um, but you have to be careful too, you know, under times of stress, um, you know, and, and things aren't going well, that's not the time to go, Hey, anybody got any ideas here? <laughs> so it's, uh, you got to pick your spots, yeah. you know, um, then the other thing that was, that I thought was really, um, interesting was, um, when I took the job, Joe Lake of our owner was, uh, was t he talked about managing in different directions. I had never heard that phrase, you know, it's managing up, managing out, managing down, managing. And I, and I think that's a big 
part of my job is to um, involve everybody um, and, and communicate with everybody. And um, so that because it's so easy, especially in a season like this one, it's so easy for management and ownership to be sort of like, well, why, you know, why did we play that guy? We lost, we've lost seven games in a row. We keep, keep putting that guy out, you know, and it's easy for our coaches to go, well, why did we trade for that guy? You know, and, and if there's no communication before you know it, everybody's pointing fingers. And so it's sort of my job to, to try to communicate in every direction and be able to pave those, those roads, you know, as they get bumpier. So I had one more maybe before we turn it over to, um, to our group um, about sort of the difference between the external facing organization and what's going on internally. Um, and I'm thinking back to 2017 when um, the external reputation of the Warriors was suddenly took on this kind of weird, evil, I don't even know what happened there, but it seemed like it was different from what was happening internally. And I'm just wondering how you thought about whether that was a problem for the team, whether you tried to buffer people, whether you tried to change the external reputation. You know, how do you think about that tension and do you try to manage it in some active way? We kind of embraced it. I think it was, um, I think what happened was in 15, we were sort of the surprise right. team and so we were the, we were the darlings of the NBA. Everyone loved the way we played, and, and you know people were tired of the same old teams winning, and, and we had lost for 20 years. The Warriors had been bad for about 20 years. We, um, we know. Yeah, you remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were, they, were, uh, you know, they were on the rise, um, 13, uh, 13 and 14 on the rise, and then 15 we got, you know, got over the hump, and... Everybody was like, oh my God, Steph Curry, and this is so much fun. And, and then when Kevin Durant joined us, that was when we became the super villains. That's yeah. what, you know, we were, the people thought it was too much. And so we embraced it and um, we, we had t-shirts made and nice. super villain t-shirts. And yeah. Steph had a, a, a party at his house and big super villains balloons nice. in the backyard. And we just tried to make fun of it more than anything. But um, it, it, it's impossible to control the, the narrative on that stuff, you know, especially in, in sports, you know, it's, it, um, you just, you just go, you just play and you do, yeah. you know, do your best and have fun with it. Let me ask one more before we turn yeah, it over, please. which is, um, so you're obviously trying to build a culture for the long term. And yet there are seasons, perhaps this is one, where you might face some tensions between playing for the current season versus mm -hmm. making choices that sustain the long-term culture. Have you ever faced that kind of trade-off and how have you thought about managing it? I think um, I, I actually look at it differently. I think um, if you can maintain a culture through a season like this, then you can survive. Yeah. And then when, thing, when your circumstances get better, then you can thrive. But the culture gives you that foundation and that structure, um, and, and so you don't compromise. You know, during the during the down period, you don't change your your values. You don't change what's important. Um, you don't take any shortcuts. Um, so you still stick to to what you do, and 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 um, you do it authentically, and you you trust that things are going to turn around. Uh, Keep, keep going. Keep great moving. advice. Yeah. Great advice. I wish more organizations would follow that the advice. The problem is most people get fired if that, you know, <laughs> when that happens. But yeah. so far, I'm still here. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, so how about Barry Saw, who has written articles on hot streaks and things like that? Uh, so I'd like your comments on the role of emotion in coaching and uh, you've been known to break some clipboards on the <laughs> sidelines and we have no idea what's gone on in the halftime uh, uh, locker room and uh, there may be worse than clipboards uh, and uh, so if you would make some comments on 
sort of the role of emotional expression both on the negative side and the positive side and uh, when they're useful and when they're not so useful and, uh, sure, and so sure. forth. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's important for uh, the team to know how much I care and how much I want to win. Um, and I'm a, I'm a very, I'm actually a very laid back person. And my wife has a, a, a saying for, for me, and I think she read it in a poem. It's, it's beware the fury of a patient man. You may have heard that somewhere before, but it's, um, that's who I am. I'm, I'm extremely patient, and that's how I am as a coach. I'm very patient. And um, every once in a while, I just, my patience finally runs out and I snap. And it's usually with the officials, or it's with uh, our own play, and and um, it's I probably break a cl two clipboards a year, and uh, I I th I I actually think it's good uh, for the team to see it uh, because I'm most of the time I'm extremely calm um, in practice in games. My halftime speeches are boring. I'm not you know if for when you play 82 games in the season. You can't be Newt Rockney every night. You know they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna go nuts. Uh, so every once in a while, I think it's good to to kind of snap and and wake them up and remind them how important it is. And uh, so that's kind of my my style. Virginia. Uh, so as a coach, who have you been informed by more Phil Jackson or Pop? And uh, which strategies from them do you think is more effective considering uh, the team you lead now? So uh, both have influenced me dramatically um, in a lot of different ways. Our practice, uh, the, the, the technique, the, uh, the teaching that we do, the drill work comes from both coaches. Um, my personality is more like Pops than it is Phil's. Phil was um, in, an incredibly interesting coach, and I loved playing for him. Um, he and Pop are very different in that um, you know, Pop has a military background. Uh, Phil, uh, more of a hippie, you know, 70s hippie. Um, you know, he would burn incense after we lost a game. And, you know, <laughs> Really and we, we meditated. I've never meditated before. We would, we would meditate as a team. And, you know, the first time you meditate with the Chicago Bulls, you're wondering when everyone's going to laugh at you. Like, <laughs> but it's, it was real. It was genuine. And, uh, you know, whereas Pop is more, much more military, straightforward. This is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. What I loved about both of them, they're, they're very different from one another, but they both had the same quality of um, you uh, you knew they cared about you like you could feel that they loved you and they cared about you but you were a little afraid of them you know <laughs> just a little bit almost like like you'd feel about a parent you know like uh, you know you just you didn't want to disappoint them that's probably the better way to put it. No, you're not afraid physically but just you were afraid to, to disappoint them and it's a really, I think it's a good quality for a leader because they both cared so deeply about me and my family and they knew everything about uh, my life and, and they asked questions and they, you know, they were more engaged and more involved with me than any, any coaches I ever had. Uh, knew all my kids' names and I mean, that, that stuff matters, you know. And then at practice, if you, know, if you, if you weren't on it, you were going to hear it. And, so that's what a great combination, you know. Max, come here, Mike. So while while we're on Phil Jackson, I I I, I I'm not local, so I'm not that close to the Warriors. But I was in Chicago for your Bulls years, and the fifth championship season was rocky. Yeah. And Rodman was at his most distinctly unusual phase. <laughs> but you barely won the championship. Yeah. And then there was question about whether Jordan was coming back. He took two months to decide. And it seemed like the Bulls were, had a very contentious relationship with Rodman. After this sort of difficult yet winning season, 
How did the Bulls put their culture back together again so they won the next year? Okay, so that was, so you're talking about 97, and then we came back and won. Yeah. 98, yeah. Um, so 98 was a really difficult year. And, and that's when, you know, it just felt like we were running on fumes. And, um, and the, the year after, the whole team blew up. Every, Michael retired, and everybody left, and Phil Jackson left. And, and I, I think that's probably, I'm going to get a little off track here, but that's probably the hardest thing for, for anybody to understand is, is the, 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 the difficulty in sustaining the success in the NBA for five straight years, the emotion that's expended. Um, you know, our team this past year was just exhausted by the end. And that's what I remember about that 98 Bulls team. We were just exhausted. But Michael Jordan was superhuman. He, he was, there's never been anybody like him. As good as LeBron is, um, as good as Kobe was, there's never been a, a human being like Michael Jordan. And so he, literally just decided we were going to win, and so we won. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to explain Should it. Should we go to the, the, the back, back here yeah. at table 13? So sticking on Michael Jordan, you punched him in the face. And, and you, you mentioned that, that that actually kind of helped make your relationship stronger. <laughs> And, and we've seen recently. I know it seems weird, but it did. No, no, no. And, well, and that's actually what I want to get at because, we, like, you know, recently with, with the Warriors and Draymond, and um, the, there, there was conflict there as well yeah. that actually seemed to make the relationships fracture a little bit. Would you mind talking a bit about what culture can do to help repair conflict so that it heals and relationships grow stronger versus fracturing? Yeah, I think, um, I think what was important in Chicago was that Phil fostered a, a, a culture where there was a lot of communication. And, you know, usually in the NBA, you just show up and, and, and on the court to practice. And if you're going to watch uh, some video, you, you, uh, you know, you, you watch a couple things and it's strategy and then you, you move on. But Phil used to, we used to meet in a, in a room. Uh, it was a communal gathering more than anything before every practice. And he would show it was strategic, but it was also uh, about communication. And so he generated this, uh, this, this uh, environment where we, were, we talked all the time um, about anything. And um, so it, it made it much easier um, to get through the difficult stuff when you already were communicating every day. Um, on teams that don't do that, they have team meetings. And then the press finds out about it, and it's like, oh my God, they had a team meeting. You know, everything must be going haywire. They had a team meeting. Whereas with us, every, we met every day. So I think that's, um, that's how to get through it, is, is fostering that communication on a daily basis. Should we go with my, Michael here? Um, when you see somebody execute a, oh, sorry. When you see an organization execute a new strategy that's very successful, like the strategy around three-point yeah. shots. You always ask, why didn't anyone do it before? You know, why didn't somebody do it 10 years ago or 20 mm -hmm. years ago? And is it a coincidence that you were a three-point shooter? Did, it, did leading, like being able to say, trust me, I've been there, I've done this. You know, even, you know, these, like Steph Curry wasn't that great in college. So like, how did you, how did you create that? How did you make them believe that that would work? Um, it's interesting because I've, I've, I'm not an innovator. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a product of my own experience. And so um, the way we've played the last five years was really a combination of uh, what I learned in Chicago and San Antonio. And, and then in Phoenix, I was the general manager of the Phoenix Suns when Steve Nash was playing there. Uh, from 2007 to 10, and th that team really um, changed the way the NBA really started to play. And their coach, Mike D'Antoni, who's now the Houston coach, he's really uh, the innovator. Uh, a little bit like Don Nelson uh, here, 
for for longtime Warriors fans. Don Don Nelson was a he was an innovator. Um, Talk about incense. Yeah, he, yeah he's, just saying. He's got he's got his own version of incense. Yeah. Uh, he lives in Hawaii now. Yeah, that's right. But I, I think um, what happens in the NBA, we all sort of copy from each other. Um, we see a good play. I see a good play. I clip it. I you know I give it to my video guy. I go, hey, we, keep this one. We might run this one next week. Somebody takes one from us. I'll I'll be watching a game. I'll go, hey, that's our play. You know, and then we so we all kind of steal from each other. And it, so if you think of it in sort of big picture, over time, this stuff all adds up. And so what we started doing five years ago, it wasn't that innovative to me, but it was a combination of some of the things that, that I had learned, combined with the fact that those two guys that were in the picture, Steph and Clay, could shoot from 35 feet out. Mm -hmm. And um, the first couple of months of the season, I, Steph was taking shots that every coach I had ever had, I could hear their voices saying, don't let him shoot that shot. <laughs> and I finally realized I had to let go because he was a different guy. And so it, it wasn't like I was this, you know, innovator. It was more just, you know, it just sort of, things sort of take time to evolve. But a lot of people have a, uh, you know, they, they have a factor in that. And it's, it just takes time. Pierre? <clears throat> Uh, you know, you're selected, but at times you step out of basketball and you make comments on gun control and politics and war and all that. And so are you doing that uh, because you're using your platform and your personal beliefs, or are you doing it to reinforce the culture and connect with your players and the organization, or are you doing it for both, or how do you think about when you do it? I, I, I do it um, just because I have the platform and it becomes, it's, it's authentic. It's, I genuine, genuinely, genuinely believe in the things that I say. Um, but the byproduct of that is that the players get to know me better and they know what's important to me. And, uh, and they themselves um, feel uh, like they can use their voice. And, uh, and so it's, I think it's been a, a positive part of our culture without having really given that much thought. Um, but the authenticity is what, is what makes it work culturally. Right, right here, table two. Run! <laughs> Thank you, Merrick. Uh, culture can be made up of many things, and location can be one of them. So, curious to know, how has the culture shifted in the move to Chase, if any, if at uh -huh. all? Uh, and then, how do you plan to preserve the essence of Oracle that has been developed, you know, yeah. for forty-seven years? Yeah. 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 Um, so the um, one way we tried to preserve the essence of Oracle is our, our locker room, the player locker room. Um, the roof actually looks just like the roof of Oracle. So the, the, it's a round locker room. And if, if, you know, if you were in Oracle and you looked up and you go into that locker room, you look up. So the first thing I noticed when I looked, looked up in that locker room, that's Oracle. So it's, it's pretty cool, just little touches. We have a lot of uh, uh, memorabilia on the wall uh, commemorating you know, Oracle and past teams and that sort of thing. Um, with that said, it's been um, you know, it's an interesting move. The, the young players, we have like seven or eight new guys, and they don't know any differently. They just got here. But for the older guys, it's been a, a huge adjustment. and. Um, the, for us, the, the culture doesn't change in terms of the way we present it and, and try to approach it. Um, but it feels different, for sure. Uh, table seven. Coach, so uh, can you talk a little bit more about assimilating new players into your culture? Um, so before you draft a college player, before you trade for experienced player, free agent, um, are you evaluating them for their potential of fit in your culture? And as they come on board, how much of it is your role versus a leader like Steph's role to help assimilate them into the culture of the Warrior Way? So we're doing a, we do a lot of uh, background um, before we 
sign a player, trade for him. Um, so we have college scouts who not only watch the players, but try to find out as much as they can about them um, through media members or you know trainers, um, coaches that, who are friends of theirs. So we do a lot of homework, try to try to get guys who will fit in. And then once the, the player is here, um, it's uh, it's nothing that's discussed. It's just continuing to approach our day the way we approach it. Um, you know, trying to make those those values that we talked about in the beginning come alive. And um, and the players will feel that if it's authentic, they'll feel it. And as they're assimilating, um, they get more and more comfortable. And and um, again, I think I think enjoying. Coming to work is just a huge part of it, and um, and so so trying to create the environment that will allow for that is is key for us. Courtney, you're back there, table sixteen. So I love hearing about the talent. It's it's obviously the most exciting part of the Warriors organization. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you've used your culture and, and the things that you mentioned that are important to you in your coaching staff, in the back office. I mean, it's a large organization that runs the, the whole the, uh, Warriors. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about um, trying to, uh, trying to include everybody and and let everybody know that um, ideas are welcome and um, we uh, one of my one of my favorite stories is the uh, the Andre Iguodala story we talked about earlier that was the suggestion of our video intern um, actually first year he, w he was not an intern he was uh, he was a first year video guy and he called me the night before and he said hey what do you think about about this, and and uh, so we did it, and then uh, you know I, I gave him the the credit the next day in the media, and he got all this coverage. It was great because he was really embarrassed about it, and then everybody called him Boy Wonder after that. <laughs> and um, but I, but I think tr you know trying to um, share as much credit is really key. Greg Popovich is probably the best I've ever seen with that. Um, you know, really making it about the players and making it about um, everyone else the best you can um, is, uh, is key. And, um, you know, I, Pop would never write a book or do a TV, TV commercial or do any endorsements. You felt really strongly that that had to be the domain of the players. And um, as soon as, soon as you, he started being the center of attention, it would, it would um, kind of ruin his credibility as a leader. So I think all, all those are things that come to mind when you ask that. Have it right here. So You've um, mainly discussed the positive effects of culture at an organization like the Warriors, but turning to the like NBA and professional sports, to what extent do you think culture is an impediment to things like a female head coach or more openly gay athletes or those types of changes? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the? Oh, sorry. To what extent do you think culture is an impediment at the level of like organizations like the NBA or professional sports more broadly mm -hmm. to changes like female head coaches or openly gay athletes yeah. or those types of things? Yeah, it's a good question, I, and I think that's um, probably more societal um, than individual cultural uh, culture of, a, of an organization. Um, I think the NBA has done a, a pretty good job in terms of uh, minority hiring uh, of um, in, in in positions of coaching and management. Um, Female referees, I think we have four or five female officials. More and more female uh, coaches, uh, in, including Lindsay from Cal, who got yeah. hired by uh, Cleveland. And um, awesome. that one sort of stung a little bit because um, she was, she'd come to our practices a lot and, and 
I love Lindsay, and I thought, I had no idea. Like, I just thought she'd be the Cal coach forever. And so when she took that job, it's like, well, why didn't we think of that, you know? <laughs> um, but the, you know, these barriers take, take a while to, to, to uh, break down in a societal way. You know, Rick Welts, our uh, president, first openly gay uh, team executive in sports history, um, and I think that was maybe less than 10 years ago that, that he came out. Maybe it was eight years ago. That's nothing. Uh, so it's, it's not just sports. It's a societal thing. But sports can help break down those, those barriers in a lot of cases, too. How about here? At, oh, sorry. Table 11. Oh, table 11. Then we'll come to you, Jeff. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Katja, I can see a lot of parallels between the Warriors organization and the role that the media plays in maybe um, trying to break down the culture and large organizations that also have a lot of media presence. And so I'm curious what advice you have slash what strategies you use to maintain the culture when it, when it is under constant attack. Um. Well, the media relations is it's a huge part of our operation. And um, so I think developing the relationships within uh, the, the media uh, is a key for us. We have a, our PR director is named Raymond Ritter. And he's, he gets the league's PR director of the year every year. And when I worked in television, I, I, he was the one guy who would call me when I, if I was in town to cover a Warriors game. He'd call me at the hotel, say, hey, it's Raymond. Do you need anything for the game tonight? I got this, I got that. Most teams would just, you know, they'd have a, a packet of information they'd send to the hotel. But, you know, there's a personal touch with Raymond. And I think he sets a tone that's really important for our organization. And then, uh, you know, I meet with the media every day, Bob Myers periodically, uh, Joe Lacob periodically. I think it's important to have um, uh, a lot of honesty and candid conversation and building the relationships with, with key people um, can help you get through some of the more difficult times. You know, you get a, little, you get a break here and there if you, if you handle yourself well. Jeff, up here, Walter. Um, we, we heard a lot of presentations today about the use of data in organizations to measure culture, performance, and, and almost every other aspect of organizational life. And in some ways, you see organizations catching up to the world of sports in the use of analytics. As you think about your experience, but also looking across the league, how, in what ways can analytics uh, help culture, reinforce it, and in what ways can it, can it uh, get in the way? I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't know how to answer that. Um, we have an analytics group, um, four people who basically provide uh, reports for us every day, game reports after you know after games and um, various projects that they're they're working on. Um, but in terms of how it how it affects our culture. Um, I don't know. I think I think the players understand that this this is a new frontier in the NBA, and uh, we're we're using a lot of different technology. Uh, in practice, we've got we've got cameras uh, in our facility where players are, will actually sh shoot the ball and they'll hear the angle and the, of the degree of arc on their shot, oh, and then wow. there'll be an audio. That's and so so I think players are embracing it, and so. Um, I think the, the, probably the best thing that comes from it is the players understanding that we're just trying to make them better and help them get better. And we're searching for every possible way. Time for a few more. Uh, Dan, there in the back. <coughs> Thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's really a delight. I just wondered, what is it that you've learned as a coach that you wish you'd known when you were a player? That's a great question. Um, 
I think uh, I wish that I could have followed some of the advice that I have now, <laughs> but I was incapable of it as a player. I was, uh, you know, when you're playing, sometimes you, you just, you get hard headed, you get set in your ways. I was very hard on myself. When things didn't go well, I would, you know, I'd beat myself up. And so much of what I'm trying to teach our guys is to, to be loose and free and enjoy the, the process and, and to be mindful about, about the way we play. Um, and I needed, to, I needed more of that in, in my own game. I got in my own way way too often as a player. Um, and the, the, Phil Jackson was probably the best coach I had in that regard in terms of trying to help players get out of their own way. Because there's, there's players, some players are never in their way. Steph is never in his own way. He just plays. And that's one of the reasons I think fans enjoy watching him play so much. There's, um, I was telling these guys earlier, one of my favorite Steph games, you, you guys may remember this if you're a big Warriors fan. He, when he came back from an injury in the 16 playoffs, he played a game in Portland. And he missed his first 10 three-pointers. And then on the 11th, he made it, and he did this shimmy dance. And during the timeout, I said, Steph, you're one for 11 in a shimmy. He's <laughs> like, and he, it didn't even cross his mind, you know? I would have stopped shooting at 0 for 4, because I would have been like, there's no way I'm making a shot tonight. You know, you suck. You know, like, I, I would have beaten myself up. But he's so, he just has this freedom and this belief and, and, and Trying to coach that is um, it's one, of my, one of my goals, is to get our players to get out of their own way and to allow their talent to shine. Um, and I wish I could have coached myself in that, in that regard. Let's do one last question. One last question. How about over here? You had mentioned that Phil Jackson actually sort of set the norm for the team in terms of communications. Mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, I mean, how did he do that? And how did he encourage the players to communicate with one another, you know, which really helped set the culture, too? Yeah, it's a good question. He, so Phil had a, um, he grew up in South Dakota, and he had a love for uh, Native American history. And so our gathering room um, was, it looked like a museum. It was adorned with Native American art. And we would, we would gather in that room each day. And we'd usually watch some film, uh, do some strategy stuff. Uh, but he, he had a lot of different um, visitors who would come in and, and speak with us. Um, we'd, we meditated, as I mentioned. He'd have somebody come in and lead us in meditation. Um, and he had all kinds of different ways that he would get us to talk, and he would uh, he would ask us questions during the film. Um, what, you know, what would you do in this in this case? Um, and maybe there's a rookie uh, in the room who doesn't say anything, and if we're playing a we're playing a team who has a team a former teammate of this guy. He says, "Hey, you know, so and so would you know." Tell us about this guy. You played with him in college. You know, what's he like? You know, and poor guy's you know scared to death to talk, but he has to talk. And Phil used to used to say all he say to us all the time: Men are afraid to talk to each other. He said, Women will talk to one another, which is, I don't know if that's sexist or not, but it's just you know it's sort of true, right? Men don't really want to communicate as well. We sort of grunt. And, and you know, and and women will are much more capable, I think, of breaking down barriers and communicating. And so, sports teams, you double that just with the the amount of ego in the room. And and um, so, so it could be anything. It could be anything, but generating that conversation is uh, is key. So what I try to do, what we gather in our film room, um, and before. We start watching our film. Uh, if there's a topic of the day, if there's, you know, yes, yesterday I asked I asked the guys if they had watched the national championship football game, and we all started talking about the game, and and you know you just you, anything, just get them to talk, and um, so that they feel more comfortable when there's actually something substantial to talk about. Well. Um... 
I want us to thank Coach Kerr for coming out all the way over now from Sorry. San Long Francisco, way, yeah. which is actually <laughs> the, crossing a bridge. We you don't know, venture yes. over there. Um, I, personally, I've, I've learned a lot about leadership here. I actually teach a course on leadership, so I thought I knew most of it. But um, your insights are fantastic, thank really um, terrific. And um, good luck with the rest of this season. Thank you. Um, good luck with, um, with the seasons coming up. And thank you so much for joining us and spending some time here. Thank you. Thank you so much.